welcome to our Circular Coffee conversation. Um, so this week we're actually kicking off our second theme of the year, uh, which is all around fashion. Um, and the way that we, basically the those coffee conversation started was really from during the lockdown, actually, we wanted to carry on the conversation and really amplify local initiatives, but also explore different topics. Uh, around the circular economy and around different themes. So we had the food, drink and packaging one, and now we're kicking off uh, the fashion one. And today we are very lucky to be joined by Julia uh, from Upcycle Fashion. And I will let Erica chat with her for about 15 minutes or so. And then they're gonna be maybe about 10 minutes uh, for questions that you might have. So, you know, anything popping through your mind during the conversation, put them in the chat. Feel free to introduce yourself as well and uh, and connect. So it's very informal, warm conversation uh, that we like having. So there we go, Erika, I'll pass it on to you. Cool, thank you, Sophie, and hello, everyone. Um, I'm excited today to be chatting with Julia Roebuck from Upcycle Fashion. Um, I think probably during our discussion, it will come quite clear <laughs> and we'll run through what, what, what you actually do and uh, what you've been involved with over the years. I've been lucky enough to know Julia for quite a number of years. We used to work together in an environmental NGO called Wastewatch as well um, in, in London quite a few years ago. And it's been really wonderful to see all the different things she's been involved in um, that we'll be hearing about. But first of all, Julia, I'd like to ask you, um, what circular conversation starter have you brought with you today? Well, I was having a thing, and, I, um, and there's a couple of reasons. What this? <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> so, my my two reasons for choosing a coat hanger, which I'm sure is is well, actually three. One, we all own these. Two, the most sustainable garment is the one that is hanging in your wardrobe. It's what you already own. And three is the second most sustainable one is that garment which is owned within your community. Um, when I have been organizing clothes swapping events and pop-up shops for charity shops, having things on hangers and on rails in a different space makes it feel like an event, like a proper retail space, like an exciting space that people want to go to, not just having loads of stuff out on tables and a bit jumble sale kind of table toppy. Having things on hangers elevates it and creates a space that people actually want to engage with and brings secondhand clothing into people's lives in a slightly different way. So that's why I've chosen a coat hanger today. <laughs> Nice, I like that. And so, yes, who would have thought so so much around that that hanger in your wardrobe as well? Could you, um, I suppose you touched on some of those elements there, but explain a little bit about your background and maybe what inspired you to really think about some of those more sustainable aspects around um, fashion as well? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so I I'm actually calling in from Huddersfield in Kirklees in West Yorkshire. Um, I grew up here, but um, studied textile design and fashion and the environment masters at um, University of the Arts London. I made clothes all the time as a child and as a teenager, and I would rarely go to fabric stalls. I would only really ever go to the charity shops and I wouldn't ever buy an item of clothing and keep it as that. I'd use charity shops as a fabric shop. So I'd go around and I'd look for a fabric or a colour or a pattern of whatever it was and turn it into something completely different uh, with varying degrees of success uh, throughout my teenage years um, and that resulted in me really wanting to develop that through a textiles uh, BA and um, so I moved down to London to do that and then whilst I was on my textiles BA it was at Chelsea College of Art and Design and at the time they had um, a hub called TED which is textiles environment design and that's now changed its name to Centre for Circular Design, and that's headed up by Becky Early, and um, it was even in 2005 uh, when I moved to London, and Becky Early was curating an eco-fashion exhibit at the Crafts Council in London, and they just put a call out, and I saw one day in the corridor a sort of student call out for models for this eco-fashion exhibition, so I went along to it and my allocated outfit was a junkie styling outfit, which some of you might be familiar with the brand. They're not going anymore, but at the time um, they 
throughout the 90s as well, they'd really risen up and they were a really cool upcycling brand, predominantly using men's shirting and suiting fabrics, bizarrely enough, that were uh, woven in Huddersfield. Um, so we, I modelled that outfit and that was really the first time that I saw that there was a whole load of other people who were also upcycling. I didn't know that that was even a word when I was you know, 13, um, but there was a whole load of other people doing this and doing it way better than I was doing it. And I was so excited to have found those people and, and that, that time. So that was in 2005 in London and um, more things started to happen. So uh, also de Castro established Aesthetica, which was the sort of environmental fashion bit that ran alongside London Fashion Week. Um, Christopher Rayburn started his design. He was upcycling parachutes and military you know, wear and he's, that brand's going really strong now. He's just gone from strength to strength. So I was in London at that time and really inspired and really kind of found that the place where I wanted to be in terms of my work and um, established upcycle fashion. Um, worked for Trade, which is a series of charity shops in London, but they're doing things really differently. Um, they're making, they've, only, they've got about 13 charity shops. Um, the money that they raise, it's they're an ethical fashion charity. So that supports garment workers in and garment kind of manufacturing projects ethically all around the world. And they're, but their retail stores um, in different parts of London have different themes, have different styles that are, are really exciting to kind of destination places to go. Um, I lived in Australia for a couple of years and the way that they uh, sell pre-loved clothing, again, is very different here. They've got big kind of TK Maxx style warehouses. And again, that are real destinations in and of themselves. The, the Salvation Army is doing amazing stuff and they have stylists working there and they appeal to a whole different kind of demographic. And then I moved back in 2015 to the UK, to Yorkshire and my tiny village and I, and I saw so much potential in, in what could be done. And so I spent the last five years really working on my, uh, on bringing upcycle fashion more in terms of advocacy and consultancy around how we get people to engage better with secondhand clothing predominantly and to get people really excited about it. Interesting, it's almost like that, that kind of full circle round. And when you when you go back to those choices that you, you said as a child, you already, you know, went to second hand, were, were attracted to, to making your own clothes. What do you think instigated that? And, and do you think there's a big area of education or, or young people today um, to kind of support encouraging that as well? Yeah, absolutely. One of my main aims through Upcycle Fashion is to get young people engaged with second hand. That's partly because as a young person, I engaged with it and got so much from it. Um, you know, I didn't necessarily want to be a fashion designer or anything at the time, but just learning practical skills for mending and making clothing, you know, clothing forms a massive part of our identity and who we are. And um, it played such a big part in my in my youth. Um, but I also really like to focus on young people because they're so heavily targeted by the fast fashion and online brands. You know, that's 16 mm -hmm. 24 age gap is that age range is just absolutely bombarded with, with um, advertising and marketing and you know constant change so I'm really keen to get people back into charity shops but I think the way they are at the moment especially where I live and it might be the same in Reading I'd love to hear your um as a you know as a group your experiences and your ideas on this is that things really need to change to bring young people in um, so I'm really quite keen to give them, and I think part of that starts with ownership as well, being able to collaborate with youth groups and high schools to set them projects, to physically bring them into those retail spaces and get them to overcome some of the stigmas that they might have around it being dirty or smelly or like a couple of teenage girls will, you know, in, invariably in every group will say, oh, what if someone died wearing it? You know, that those kinds of things, they can be overcome by just bringing I've seen it happen, just getting them to interact with it, with that clothing. <laughs> I, I, I wore a charity shop thing today in honour of our, uh, <laughs> from Edinburgh, Edinburgh has very, where my sister lives in Edinburgh, it's got very nice uh, charity shops as well. And I worked in one actually in the past and saw that the power of, of just presenting things differently, making the shopping experience 
experience or, or being there a kind of a different type of fair and how that did change people's perceptions as well. I also got the sewing kit out and, and, and sewed it the weekend also and I've had holes in this jump cardigan for ages but I was like right I'm gonna do it for Julia. So could you describe a few other, I know you do lots of different kinds of um, projects and, and things to upskill um, as well. Could you describe some of the little tutorials or other kind of projects or, or things that you've done to kind of help yeah, upskill people like me who aren't brilliant? <laughs> well, I'm a, I am a firm believer in just using hand sewing in workshops. Um, even though sewing machine sales have grown exponentially over lockdown, um, I believe there can be a bit of a barrier. So hand, teaching fundamental hand sewing skills is something that I believe is really important. Um, there's a whole load of work going on around getting into primary curriculum. It's not taught in the home anywhere near like it was you know, 50 years ago. So communities have a, have a big opportunity to kind of pick up and teach those skills. So hand sewing skills and three stitches fundamentally, a kind of running stitch, a back stitch and a cross stitch for not only just simple mending or sewing back on a button, but also being able to do some fairly simple embroidery stitches to customize something as well. So either completely changing the buttons on a garment, if, you know, not if, even if they've not fallen off, but if you've got a, a white shirt and you want, and they've got some white buttons on, you know, even just changing those to black buttons can really change something. So buttons is one that I like to do, those basic sewing stitches. Stitches for also embroidery, like I said, with the different coloured embroidery flosses, whether it's your name or a, a, a figure or a bird or an abstract geometric thing on a collar or a side or a cuff, anything that can add that bit of personality and increase that emotional longevity in clothing is so powerful. Um, and everything that I do is, that, is, is underpinned by that goal of keeping clothing loved in your own wardrobe on that hanger for as long as possible. Um, second best alternative is to keep it in active use within your very local community. So those clothes swapping events, um, pop-up shops, rental platforms, sharing things, that kind of thing on a really local level. Um, well, so I also encourage uh, the, just cutting up and kind of uh, utilising uh, t-shirts and things like that. I often use t-shirts in workshops because they're a really universal garments and um, they're not particularly tied to a specific culture well predominantly in the west but culture or gender um and everybody has a t-shirt that they're probably not wearing much anymore it might have been downgraded into the pajama stash and especially in lockdown we might have just downgraded that into the the home working stash um but it's cutting up t-shirts in various different ways to create yarn to create t-shirt bags oh my gosh i've made so many t-shirt bags in lockdown um and invariably, you know, on a t-shirt, it's under the arms and the neckline that get the most staining. So things that can remove those out of the way. Um, yeah, t-shirts and stretch jersey as well. It doesn't fray, it's a knitted, it's a knitted textile. So it will just curl up and you don't have to worry about edging it or stitching it and fraying and stuff. So yeah, buttons, simple stitches for embroidery, for customization and uh, t-shirt yarn. T-shirt yarn, t-shirt bags are, are my main areas. I, I do, I, that's one thing I've not tried yet, making a t-shirt or legging yarn, I see, I'll, I'll put that on my list. <laughs> um, yeah, like people come to workshops and they say that they can't sew, you know, I get a few kind of can't sew, won't sew at public workshops. And I'm like, can you use a pair of scissors? And they're like, yeah, okay, well, make some yarn. <laughs> that's your job. <laughs> but then you've got a ball of yarn and it's so brilliant to just have, and I can, sh actually, I can show you a few things that I've made out of yarn. Um, <laughs> Because then once you show people what you can do with it, so I like knitted up, you know, plant pot holders and baskets oh, and all yeah. kinds of things. Um, and I've got a, just a stash of, of t-shirts down here. So it's a really, yeah, just having that ball of yarn is an amazing thing to have for loads of different activities at home. In terms of, um, this is, we've talked a lot about kind of making the most of the clothes you have or secondhand or reuse. In terms of it as a wide of like the fashion industry, is, as you said, predominantly built about new stuff, selling new stuff or faster and, and all of that. 
I've I've seen, and I'm not a fashion expert, a lot of kind of eco or ethical, and I'm trying to, if, if there is something new, pants or whatever, that maybe you wouldn't want to buy second hand. What are the types of things that you think are really important to look for from the more eco circular sustainable but newer kind of products whether it's the, the materials or their um the making of them and things like that yeah there's a, so there's a few different um areas to look out for and it, there's no kind of silver bullet really with this it's it, you've got to kind of tail it to your own personal preferences but um the materials we're obviously so heavily dominant like reliant on cotton and polyester and a move away from those is is really important um I'd be ha um, for me personally, recycled polyester doesn't even quite hit the mark really in terms of where we where we need to be pushing because we need we need quite radical change um, for fashion and materials. And I think moving to things like hemp, well, organics and hemp and bamboos, lyocells, which is a kind of cell engineered cellulose fiber, but it's made in a closed loop system, so the solvents can be reused in this very little water consumption used in that um, would be the main the main one in terms of materials to look out for obviously in terms of ethical standards whether that's fair trade or similar with the standards there's a few different standards coming out for ethical labor fair wages um, or made in England made in the UK is really strong I think the COVID has also kind of exposed our uh, fragility really in in terms of the reliance on a glo a really complex global supply chain for textiles and there's so much opportunity to to be manufacturing more in the UK um so that yeah they'd be my main my main points to look out for really um on ha and have a go or have a go at making your own uh on YouTube channels and things like that pants are so easy so it's something that I really want to do. Something that I really want to do, but I don't. I can't model them, so I need to, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> a way to uh, to make pants look good. Because a photograph of a pair of pants is a bit boring. So, yeah, that's the one thing. Challenge, so circular yeah. challenge. Yeah, making making pants. <laughs> um, yeah. Before I maybe pass over to Sophie for, for some other questions, or we'll see if there, there's any from the uh, the audience with us today. Um, one thing we always like to ask our guests is if you've got a particular circular business or organization or sector that you think um it would be interesting for us to try and reach out to or, or look for yeah to get on it. so um i interviewed a lady called joss whipple who um is a real sort of sustainable fashion pioneer she's um i interviewed her for my i've got a podcast that i just set up put in lockdown called one planet fashion and that's really about interviewing people who are working around alternative models for fashion that operate a really fun and exciting fashion system but within our planetary boundaries obviously I'm sure you're all here so I'm sure you're all aware is that the the current state of the fashion the global fashion textile supply chain is not operating within those planetary boundaries and people like Kate Fletcher and academics who she's written the Earth Logic Action Plan basically sets out the agenda for radically reducing uh, the consumption and production of clothing um, in terms of practical people, um, so Joss uh, has set up with some friends in Totnes in Devon uh, a project called an, a physical space, which is really exciting, called Mend Assembly. And they call themselves an alternative clothing practice. And they are all about local, really local circularity. That's something that I'd love to establish here in Huddersfield. Mm -hmm. um, that they have a pool of, of textile creators, of practitioners who can take on commissions. That they have a patent archive, they've got a materials archive, they want to be making materials locally in a circular way along with their food industries and their you know, tech industries. Um, so they're really leading the way. So I would say Mend Assembly. Brilliant. Yeah, I have not heard of them. Definitely going to look them up. They sound brilliant. And I think one thing is that, that we're also part of the Reading Climate Change Strategy and, and supporting their resource flow. So, you know, there are lots of areas of Reading that we want to try and look to see how we can bring together a lot of those I suppose, different disciplines and ideas and and help also the charity shops <laughs> as well because one thing and I think just linking back to, to what you really talked about at the beginning was was the, the platforms and the retail element yeah. and now with Depop, Vinted, all of 
I suppose a lot of the good clothes, do you see a lot of the good clothes get almost sold straight away and, and perhaps the charity shops are not getting us so good <laughs> um, things as well or, or, or how, the, how they can kind of really still retain, you know, a good income from that as well. Yeah, definitely. I think that's the, that's the negative side, isn't it, of these sites. It's great that people are having a bit more of an opportunity to engage in the in the circularity of their own clothing through rental through selling like you say on depop and also it's great that those sites exist because one of the one of the issues that people have had with charity shop shopping before is that oh they, they want a very specific thing and you go into oxfam or aguk and it's not there and it's you've only got half an hour and you know it, we're all busy aren't we the great things about those sites is that you can go in and you can say right i want a blue dress in a size 12 hardly worn good quality or whatever or worn but good quality you can use all those filters to find exactly what you want second hand so I love them for that but at the same time they are doing what has been happening to the charity retail sector as the rise of the internet and eBay has come through and also as within the charity retail sector itself it's separated so Oxfam have their boutiques and if a Burberry mm. trench coat gets donated in my local village it ain't being sold in that local village it's going to go online where <laughs> get probably 120 quid for it which makes sense you know they're a charity they want to fundraise and they want money but i've re but acting as textile hubs where the community like those clothing can stay at a really low level in the community i think there's opportunity for those charity shops to, to pick up a bit more responsibility in terms of textile hubs and be working with um, education with creatives and um, with other collective groups to to utilize that resource really locally i think it's important yeah, it's a really interesting kind of playoff, isn't it, to, to have to kind of deal with as well. Um, so it's been really inspiring to chat to you, Julia. Don't go. I'm going to pass you to Sophie and see if she's got um, any other extra questions as well. Or from yeah, do not escape. So yeah, anyone, I mean, we, there was a question around the link of all the, um, the companies that you've mentioned and so on. So I've started, I've just typed the names, but we will add all the links in the notes on the YouTube um, channel. So you've got all of that as well. Uh, right, so if you've got any question, now is the perfect time. There's five minutes left uh, for that. Um, I think it takes you know, it was really inspiring and I love, you know, the, the story from the hangar to, you know, empowering um, younger people around that and also the emotional touch and how that can increase the longevity of it. So, so it was really, really interesting. Um, there's something I picked on around the bar years and I think that's something that fascinates me in itself, but often people when, you know, the first step basically to take to stop going to fast fashion or to start sewing or reusing more and so on is often the hardest one and you talked about those value years what do you what would be your recommendation or what do you think can help removing those value years um i think making it easy for people i think um people are going to be driven by different things so i will intentionally buy second hand because of because of who i am but my my friend who's a busy mom will engage with it because it's cheaper and she's got three kids to clothe and she's just she's not really thinking about it from an environmental perspective like she's driven by price if we can if we can make it easier and convenient and give people an opportunity to see it slightly differently again kind of help people to overcome some of those stigmas so doing pop-up like if the charity's doing could do pop-up shops in taking selections of pieces into different community centres or places of worship or I guess outside do, you know I know we live in England so that's really difficult but um into into people's communities and, and I know that requires a lot of volunteers but charity shops have volunteers like charity shops have about a quarter of a million volunteers throughout the UK they're one of the, the strongest volunteering networks and um I think there's a lot of opportunity again kind of linking back to young people and engaging young people working collaboratively collaboratively with creative students who can do some styling can do some photography they get some amazing work for their portfolio and kind of work experience and also the charity shops get some cool images window displays inviting people in to style things up differently um, and making people see them differently i think we're so we've got a very ingrained culture in the uk of donating to charity shops which is great but shopping in charity shops is a completely Sort of different story for the majority of people. I would love it if everyone who donate, donated to, in lockdown was choosing to shop charity shopping first. 
that ratio is way off. So it's about, it's about making it visually different, coming at it from different angles to get people engaged. I love that. Yeah, it's easy, easy convenience and bring the community and creativity together. That's fantastic. I guess, you know, linking to that and, uh, and pushing the second use aspect, how will you price pre-loved um, items, basically, so that it really becomes appealing? Pricing, yeah, pricing. Um, so the I volunteer with my local charity shop and our pricing is really low. Like, like books for 20p, t-shirts for 50p. Um, so I, I am a fundamental believer in keeping the costs and also because the prices of high street have come down so much, you know, we can't charge more than that they buy for on the high street. So that's driven the prices down um, for the majority of stuff that we get, but we keep prices low because we want people we want to support people within our, our local community. Um, but at the same time, the, 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 the mindset, you know, I still don't want people, even though it's secondhand, I still don't want people to buy just for the sake of buying, like you would in fast fashion on the high street. You know, that's, that's, there's no point in that either. So for people to consider it, yes, choose secondhand first, but don't just buy it because it's cheap in the same way that don't just buy it from a, a fast fashion store because it's cheap, buy it because you love it, buy it because you're gonna wear it a really long time um, or can see its potential like I used to, to haul when I was about 13, you can see its potential for something else. Um, and if it's super cheap because maybe it's broken, then buy it because you want a zip, you know, don't buy a new zip from a haberdashery, buy a pair of jeans because you want a new zip and then you might use a denim to make a bag or some cushions or some, you know, really think about every detail of that piece that you're buying and what else it could be used for. And, and that creativity and that individuality can play a, a big role in that. Well, that is exciting. I think Lorena is going to be really happy. She was saying she's actually opening a shop <laughs> really soon, actually a pop-up shop next week. So she was asking about the pricing aspects. It's fantastic. Well done, Lorena. Really cool. <laughs> and then we also have Gillian that is about to start volunteering in a local charity shop, offering styling service for free, actually. Yes. Oh, That's fantastic. Amazing. Yeah. Brilliant. Well, I'd, yeah, I'd love to, um, again, I don't know how if there's a way to kind of collect all these ideas, but I'd love to hear the ideas. Um, so my project that I work is called Clothing in Circular Communities, um, and I'm always keen to hear people's stories and ideas of things that they're actually, you know, working on on the ground, like grassroots level has a massive capacity to create change and, and take on these big brands. We're all part of the fashion industry. It's not just happening somewhere else. It's, 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 we're all part of it. That's brilliant. Thank you. And there were also, I mean, we might ask you because there was also the community wardrobe. You know, there was a question, do we have any local ones? And Lorena said she's actually going to be in Karacham. So there we go. So that's fantastic how all this connection already starting happening here. I love it. <laughs> yeah. Fantastic. Right, we're coming up or unfortunately already to the end, but Julia, I wanted to say a really big thank you. I'll pick your last few words like bye because you love it. And I really out you know in, in your sentence I think it's a brilliant way to actually for us to close off today but thanks for all the advice and your energy and all the inspiration around the creativity I think it, it's absolutely fantastic to have that um, for everyone else so we're gonna carry on the fashion theme and uh, we're keeping it a bit of a surprise for the next few weeks <laughs> as we are organizing everything uh, but we will have someone else in two weeks time uh, for fashion to carry on so keep uh, tuned in and we will send as well the replay in the next couple of days uh, to you. So thanks Julia and thanks everyone for joining. Thanks for having me. Have a lovely <laughs> <time>. <laughs>